So last week we did the uh, Paul started, he's like, be strong in the Lord. Uh, know where your strength comes from so you know where to go to get it. And Paul didn't say, you know, rely on your own strength, be strong in your own power, because that's a disaster when you're dealing with spiritual things. He says, be strong in the Lord. Know where the power comes from so you know where to get it. And then he says, put on the whole armor of God. And he said that, I repeated that a couple of times. Put on the whole armor of God and so you can stand. And he said, stand like three times, I think, in the in last the last week's passage. So put on the whole armor of God. Equip yourself or suit up for the battle you're fighting. It's important that you suit up and you equip yourself for what you're actually doing. Uh, physical armor worked for the Roman army, and that was everywhere. It's like as Paul ran down this army and did like a one-to-one -one comparison of the Roman armor versus the spiritual armor and how the spiritual armor protects us. People who look around on the streets are like, yep, yeah, there's a Roman soldier. There's a breastplate, there's a helmet. There's a sword, and you know, so it, it was right there in front of them. Something they could understand. That physical armor worked for the Roman army. They were fighting physical people. They were fighting other armies. They were fighting physical fights, and so that, you know, that armor was a good thing. We showed the clip from Gladiator last week, which was a little graphic, but I thought it did a really great job showing the, how they used the shields. You know, the guys like line those things up and push them together so it's like a solid barrier and then the guys behind put them over the top you know and so you have this the safe little enclosure as the as the arrows were coming and it showed the fiery arrows being being shot off it showed a really great thing of how all this actually works since our warfare has changed our armor has changed and this might not be quite as applicable and understandable today so i thought that really really showed that well so they were fighting physical people the romans our enemy is spiritual, our enemy is unseen, and so we need spiritual armor to protect our spiritual beings. You need to put on the armor for the fight you're fighting. Uh, even in sports, you suit up for the game you're playing. Right? If, if you have like a, a guy that normally races NASCAR and he puts on a helmet, a fire suit, and he shows up to play hockey, that's gonna be kind of bad, huh? He's, he's, he's equipped, I'm no, probably, you know, he'll, he'll never burn if people try and set him on fire, but you know, he, he actually should have skates and he should have some padding because it gets a little crazy out there in the hockey rink and it's a different sport. You got to suit up for the sport that you are playing. You got to suit up for the job you're doing. Uh, you know, like dirty jobs, you, like a garbage man, if you were to walk into the boardroom, corporate boardroom, they'd look at him kind of weird because he's, you know, dressed differently. Uh, for the playing field that is there versus, you know, if a guy in a suit goes out and starts throwing garbage cans into the garbage truck, well, yeah, you're going to mess up a really good suit. you got to dress and suit up for what you're doing. Uh, when, I was, when I was going to Sac State, I got this terrible job doing roof tear off. It was like the worst job I ever had. And I go out and do that in the morning. We get there, the sun was coming up, and I do that for four hours. Get home, jump on my bike, and go to school. And it was like, I came out of that looking like a coal miner, because you're like peeling these old roofs off and rolling them up, and there's dust. And I had like a perpetual cough for the whole time I was doing this. It was, it was just awful. So I looked like a coal miner by the time I got done. I get sweaty, get home, jump on my bike, because I, I had, didn't have time to shower, and ride to Sac State and go to class and go walking in there. And I was homeless before homelessness was cool, right? <laughs> I go walk in there and people were like, whoa. After it happened a couple times, they kind of got used to it. But yeah, it was, you know, then I've been riding my bike to get there in time and I'm like sweaty and dirty and caked with, it was just gross. But it was paying to be there, man. <laughs> so kind of show up. So, you know, maybe not, I wasn't dressed like I should have been for the situation, uh, and it, it showed. You know, people looked at me kind of weird. So you gotta dress and suit up for the activity that you're doing for the battle that you're fighting. Uh, and the armor we put on, the spiritual armor, you know, the, the Romans were building a human empire, we're turning that upside down, and we are part of building a kingdom of grace and peace, of, of atonement and forgiveness and of love. Uh, and in our battle, Paul said we have the belt of truth. Truth holds stuff together, helps you move, right? If you, if you are dealing in untruth, that kind of pins you down. It keeps you, it, it limits you. Uh, have the breastplate of righteousness, it protects your heart, the seat of your emotions is what they thought back then. You know, all your vitals, uh, righteousness protects that. Uh, 
The shoes of the gospel of peace helps us to cover a lot of ground and helps us to dig in and stand so we don't fall down. Uh, the shield of faith, right? That thing that quenches the, the arrow, the fiery darts of the wicked, right? Those fiery arrows coming at you. Uh, sometimes things are coming at you so hard that those Roman shields were, were big and they just have to get down and just like hide their whole self behind that shield. Faith is like that to us. The helmet of salvation, without salvation, your noggin and your thoughts are vulnerable. Your mind will be messed with if you try and go into this battle without your salvation. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Uh, to use the sword without being dependent on the Spirit can result in a sloppy or wrong usage. And we talked about that, how people sometimes, you know, they'll bust out the, the Word of God and they're going to cut you off at the knees with it. You know, I think they're, they're kind of using it wrong. Uh, we want to use it right. We don't want to be like, you know, if you're, in a, if you're getting a surgery and the surgeon says, oops, my bad, that's not good, right? That's a sloppy and improper usage of a very uh, precise and sharp instrument at that point. So uh, we want to, it's the sword of the spirit, and so we need to use that in step, in conjunction, uh, under the, the control and the guidance of the spirit then at that point. We should look to the Spirit for guidance in using, in using that. So we're going to pick it up today in verse 18. Uh, chapter 6, verse 18. And pray, on the, pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given to me, so I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. So pray in the Spirit on all occasions. And that's a, that's a good idea, because you've got the sword of the Spirit, so you want the direction of the Spirit, so you should pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With all, on all occasions and with all, and all kinds of requests, it, it, that reminded me of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 to 18, where it says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So that praying on all occasions, praying always, how does that work? It's like I, I'm supposed to be praying while I'm driving. I'm driving while I'm driving. And, you know, Sometimes you get confused, like, what is prayer? Prayer, do you have to be on your knees and have your hands folded a certain way and have a certain posture and, and close your eyes? Because that's not a good idea when you're driving. Then you know, there are different kinds of prayer for different kinds of situations. And yes, you can pray when you're driving. And we do that in the morning. We, you know, we've got pray time. We get to a certain point on the commute, radio turns off, and we just kind of go silent. And we're all just, you know, we're just praying for whatever comes to mind. We're praying for you guys. We're praying ahead of our day. We're praying for the people we work with, you know, that we can be a little salt and light in the place. And this is what we do. And we're doing it with our eyes open while I'm driving. You know, I don't have to close my eyes because that would, it's hard enough. It's hard enough out there. Uh, sometimes people interrupt me because they come onto my side of the road. And it's hard to maintain my concentration there. So pray on all occasions and continually without ceasing. There are different kinds of prayer. We can, we, prayer is an attitude. It's not a posture. It's not a thing that we do to check off our list. It's, uh, it's a connection. It's something that we are, right? It's, it's, it's that connection to God, that connection to the Spirit. So then being connected to the Spirit, we can rightly use the sword of the Spirit. Uh, we sometimes think of our spiritual lives like a battery. Like I go to church on Sunday and I, or I pray, I get my battery charged up and then I go out and into the world and, and do stuff. And it's not like that. I, I don't think it's like a battery. I think it's more like a, more like a cable car. Where you see those things with the light rail trains are going along, they got that thing that sticks up and touches the electrical wires above. And if it maintains contact with that, it's got electricity to make the power to drive it down the road. I think we're more like that than a battery. Uh, you know, God doesn't give us like a lot of long, long-term charge. I was, think, I was thinking of the manna. He could have, in the wilderness, right? They're like, we're hungry. And so they wake up one morning and there's this stuff and it's manna, which literally means, what is it? They're like, what is it? Well, it tastes pretty good. And so they were allowed to, you know, capture a certain amount. They couldn't store it or else it would go bad. And they, they had enough for the day. They were allowed to, to gather enough 
for the day. And, and so each day there would be new manna that would fall and that they could go out and collect. And I think it, he just sets it up like that. He wants us in constant contact with him. He doesn't want us storing him up so that we don't need him for a while and so we go out until our batteries, our batteries drain. More like that, that cable car, that light rail train, like a vacuum cleaner. If you, you know, turn your vacuum cleaner on and it doesn't run and it's not plugged in, it's like, oh, you know, it's, it doesn't work so well unless it's plugged into the wall. So we just want to be plugged into the wall. And that's what praying on all occasions for all kinds of things without ceasing, that's what that means. To be properly wielding the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, you need to stay in contact with the Spirit. So all occasions and all kinds of prayer, he says, all kinds of prayer requests. All occasions, all kinds of prayer requests. And our prayers, we, you know, there's not one way, one particular way we do prayer in every situation. These prayers of all kinds, that's organized prayers, that's disorganized prayers. Uh, eloquent prayers, you ever hear these people who can just stand up and deliver a prayer, it's like, wow, that was beautiful. <laughs> and these eloquent prayers, poetic prayers, silent prayers, group prayers, solo prayer, wordless prayer, yelling prayer, crying prayer, there's all these situations and all these kind of prayers that we do. Just pray, just pray. It doesn't matter if you think you're good at it or not. God's just happy to hear from you. Um, God doesn't judge you for your grammar while you're praying. He's like, oh, no, that was a double negative. We're going to red pen that, and you can come back and ask me later. He can give you feeling great on your prayer today. When you correct that, then you can come back and ask me again. He does, he's, not, he's not keeping track of stuff like that. He doesn't judge your grammar. doesn't judge your sentence structure. doesn't judge if you're, like, so upset that you can't get a coherent word out of your mouth. That's when the Holy Spirit steps in and goes, ah, I, can, I know what you're saying. I can hear you. I can translate that. I, I, I know exactly what you're saying, even though you're not saying anything right now. He's just glad to be hearing from you. And did you ever, did you ever fall asleep praying? Am I, am I alone in that? <laughs> Lay down at night. It's like, oh, I'm still kind of awake, so I'm just going to spend some time praying for... <sighs> <laughs> and it's usually about that fast. And man, some people feel guilty about that, right? It's like, oh, I don't know. God's going to reject me because I fell asleep when I was talking to him. Brand Hansen, in his book, uh, Blessed Are the Mitfit, Misfits, which is a really good book. If you're looking for an easy and quick read that's got some really great stuff in it. He talked about that and prayer and how he's just really not good at it. And he's, you know, kind of got pray DD. Where he'll start praying, it's like, oh, what's for lunch? And, you know, and sometimes your brain meanders. And he says, sometimes you just need to let your brain go, and your brain will land on whatever it is you should be praying for eventually. You know, sometimes God works that way. And he talks about, uh, you know, falling asleep and how he felt guilty about that for a while. But I don't know if you've ever had a, a child or a grandchild of your own or somebody else's that you're holding and you're spending time with and talking to, and they fall asleep in your arms. Did you ever get mad at him for that? You can't get mad at him for that. It's like, oh, and I think, and he says that, you know, it's more like that with God. That God, if, we, if we're crawling up and we're spending our last wake, waking moments with him and we're trying to talk to him, we fall asleep, he's just like, oh, look at that. Oh. So don't, don't feel guilty about that. Just keep in contact. Keep praying. Keep in contact with the power source and the wisdom to use the uh, word of God as an offense and a defense. Be alert, Paul says, and keep on praying for all God's people. Be alert. In the Greek, it means be sleepless. Be ready. Be alert. And it's like, so make a pot of coffee because you know, we're going to be staying awake. Ain't nobody sleeping ever again. That's not what it means. <laughs> but it does mean to be on the alert when you're on. It's good to rest sometimes. Sleep is awesome. I love sleep. And resting is awesome. And, you know, taking time off and retreat, you know, like just retreating and going to spend a time with God and just resting is okay. It's awesome. But when you're on, when you're out there, when you're doing life day to day, uh, pay attention. Be on the alert. 
And you know, Paul in the early church, Paul and like oh the the twelve disciples, and then the eleven that were left, and you know all of them except one died a martyr's death. And Paul, it didn't end well for him. Uh, these guys had a lot of grit. They had a tough go of their walk, and uh, by some estimates, six million people were killed as a result of their faith in the church's first 270 years. That's a lot of people. And uh, it was hard. It was hard, it was costly. And they needed to be praying for each other. And even today, I mean, it's not, people aren't looking for us yet <laughs> because we're having church, because we're Christians. Uh, we've got, so we got it pretty easy compared to what these guys have, but still, we should be praying for each other. We get comfortable, I get comfortable, and I don't pray as much. I get comfortable, I blow that off, I forget. It's like everything's okay, I'm not really thinking about it. Hardship comes, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, that's right, I need to be praying. And that's, you know, that's one of those blessings of the hard things when they come, is that it refocuses you. So as they were praying for each other, and these guys, man, they had the grit, they had the danger, they were, their lives were on the line every single day. They needed to be praying for each other. We need to be praying for each other too, because we've all got our own things that we're dealing with, our own hazards out there in life that we're dealing with. So be observant and be listening for people that need prayer. Be sensitive to the nudging of the Holy Spirit. If you've ever been out and about, and sometimes, you know, even the not so good circumstances, people will enter your life it's like, wow, I really don't like that person right now. And rather than hate on them, we should pray for them. And there's people, you know, if the Holy Spirit is just like, Holy, sometimes people will come to my mind and it's like, oh, okay, I'm going to pray for that person right now. You know, even if that's not what God's saying, what could it hurt, right? But they're, they're on my mind right now. I'm going to pray for them. Or you, you're going through life and you, you just see a person. It's like, man, something's going on with that person. I just really feel like they're having a thing right now, and I'm going, to, I'm going to pray for them. So just be sensitive. Have your eyes open. Be alert. Be looking around, looking for opportunities, looking for those people that need it, and do it. And pray for random people, even if they're the unpleasant ones. Those people that... I talk a lot about our commute and people on the road, and, but, you know, it's, it's so much better if I pray for them than gripe. I'm really good at griping about them, Am I? Yeah. And sometimes my wife points that out, and you know, I, I, I pray for them instead. Those get really bad service at a restaurant or something, or you know, those, those coworkers that just, just are like sandpaper on your skin. Pray for them. Just pray for them. Random people. It's like, oh, there's that sandpaper guy again. I'm gonna pray for him right now. He's going through some stuff. He's gotta go home with himself at the end of the day. I don't have to go home with him, but I'm gonna pray for him that, that going home with himself is gonna be a better thing for him in the future. I'm gonna pray for that guy. And then Paul says, remember that I am one of the Lord's people as well. So pray for me too. Don't forget to pray for me over here. I'm Paul in prison. Don't forget me. Uh, and the prayer Paul asked for, like the Philippians, not that he would get sprung out of jail, that wasn't his first concern. I'm sure he prayed for that, he wanted that. He's like, I would rather not be in prison right now, but that's not gonna be my first concern. This is where God has me, this is where he's got me planted. So he prays that he would, that, that he would be able to speak the gospel boldly and speak when he should, and that he'd have an impact where God had him, and would bloom where he was currently planted. So it's like, man, I, just, you know, I want you guys to pray for me that I will have the strength, that I will have the guts, fortitude, the grit, to say what I need to say when I need to say it. To not back down, to not water anything down that I have to say, that I would just, you know, just give the gospel, just deliver it, say what I should at all times. Which is pretty big. Also, never assume any church leader has it all together and doesn't need your prayer. Some of these guys in these big churches, I watch them, like, man, they are so put together. They got nice clothes, right? Get the guys up there with the skinny jeans and the nice shirt and fifteen hundred dollar shoes, and they're up there. Like, man, they got it so together, and they're so eloquent and so good in front of a crowd. What do they need prayer for? 
Never assume that. We're a little different here because I'm, you know, I'm practically spiritually naked in front of you guys. You know who I am. <laughs> you know, you know my faults. But, but even so, if I look like I have it together on any given day, don't assume that I'm bulletproof. I covet your prayers. Every, every leader is fighting battles in some way at any given moment. They're fighting some battles. So we all need your prayers. And then, verse 21, Tychicus. That's a great name. Nobody ever names their kid Tychicus anymore. <laughs> I used to pronounce that Tychicus before I learned how to properly do it. It's like, you tie your own cheeks, pal. <laughs> Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant, sorry about that, faithful servant in the Lord will tell you everything so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. I'm sending to you, sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. So Tychicus, he's it's kind of a, like one of those sidebar people. We don't know a lot about him, but... We know that he was a frequent companion of Paul, that he traveled a lot with Paul, uh, worked with Paul, did ministry with Paul. Paul calls him a beloved brother and faithful minister. That is a good Yelp review in the Bible. Ditch gets five stars, right? <laughs> beloved brother and faithful minister. He was often used as a messenger, and that's what Paul promised here. He's like, I'm, gonna, you know, I'm writing you this letter, but I'm going to send Tychicus to you guys so that he can break down and tell you the rest of everything, that I don't have time or that I can't get into this one letter and you know, maybe more updated information at that point. He'll come and he'll fill you in on all the rest. I'm sending him to you that he would encourage you. That yes, I'm in prison, but it's not all that bad. God's at work, things are happening. I want him to come and encourage you at the heart level. And there's also, there's a power of presence. There's a power in being present one another. Paul could have just wrote the letter like, hey, I writ you guys, so that's good enough, right? But he just send this other guy to them who was available to travel to go be with them because there's a power in being present together. The power of incarnation. Um, I was listening to a podcast this last week, um, The Holy Post. It's a good, it's a good podcast. It's you know, got some good thinky stuff on it. And they were talking about technology and how technology has intersected the church and how it's such a train wreck on so many levels, so good in some ways, and so damaging to churches and others. And the one gal that was doing the, the interview, she goes to a small Episcopal church where, you know, she's like, I'm so glad because she travels, you know, and speaks and does stuff and can't always be there. So she can watch online and, you know, we got people that are able to watch online here and that's good. And, and she says, I hear a child crying in the crowd and I know who it is. You know, and I, I hear voices and I know, I know those people. I know who they are because the rest of the time when I'm there and you got people to come and serve me communion and call me by name, they know me. And I'm, I'm so glad I can follow along but that's not all there is. That's just like a supplement to the power of being together, the power of incarnation. And she said she went to a mega church and it was like huge, the production was great. You know, you get your sound, the hazers, the lasers, all the good stuff going on. You know, the, the bomb and band and the, the epic pastor up on the platform and the nice outfit and the good hair and, and uh, she said they did communion and you just went, you, they like subdued the lights, you went into the corner, you got the communion, you did the communion, there was no handing out the communion, there was no contact, the lights were down so you couldn't really see, and she said it was so, it's so different. And you know, we have all this great technology that is so helpful but so damaging, and it's so hard to balance that out. But just know that the power of presence is good. So showing up together, seeing each other, hugging each other, talking to each other, looking in eyeballs with each other, it's good, we need to be doing that. Uh, otherwise, you know, Jesus just would have sent us a text. <laughs> he, he didn't know. He was like, I'm not coming to that earth. I'm kind of, it's good here. I'm not going to come down there with you guys and I'll just text, LOLs. <laughs> You'd be my BFF on Instagram or something, you know? So, yeah, incarnation and physical presence is important. So don't, don't, don't forget that. Don't, don't put that off. Verse... 23, 24, we're pulling into the station here. We're going to do it. 
Look at us. Peace to the brothers and sisters, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. So Paul's final words to close the letter. Peace, love with faith, grace. And he usually opens them and signs them that way with grace and peace. And here he's got love and faith as well. Those are, I love that he puts that right up front because that reminds us, you know, I think we should write a letter to ourselves every day. Just put that somewhere. Grace and peace as we're going into the day, as we're coming out of the day. Grace and peace and love, these are the things that really matter. So there we go. We have finished the book of Ephesians. We've learned how to be seated. We've learned how to walk. We've learned how to stand. And that reminded me of Psalms 1, where it says, and this is going way back in time, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or uh, walk in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but those whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither what they do prospers. So even back then they're talking about the, the walking, the standing, the, the being seated. These, we spend most of our waking hours doing one of those things. Right? We're either standing, we're walking, we're sitting. If we're laying down, we're sleeping. Uh, get to a certain age, you can fall asleep seated as well. But, <laughs> It's, a, it's almost a gift when you get to that age. Yes, it's like, I can sleep anywhere, anytime. Just close my eyes and <laughs> gone. But we spend most of our time in doing this one thing, walking, sitting, standing. And, you know, don't walk in step with the wicked. Uh, don't sit with the mockers. Uh, and Paul has, has shown us by talking to the Ephesians. He's written this letter to the Ephesians. And again, this was a general letter. So they read it, and then it was sent on. It was Lots of people received this letter on how to stand, sit, walk. And uh, you have to be careful how and where you sit, how and where you walk, how and where you stand, and the company you keep while you do these things, because it will catch up with you if it's not good. And this letter has been all about that. Uh, in the letter of the Ephesians, we've seen how to have peace in being seated with Jesus. We're still hiking. We're still living here on this earth. But we've taken our citizenship and we've changed it. We've transferred it. We're no longer citizens of this earth, of this earthly, fleshly realm. We have taken that citizenship and we have transferred it to heaven. And we've got to live here now, but we're actually citizens elsewhere, up in Jesusopolis. And even the Gentiles were chosen and wanted. Jesus has a place for each one of us at his table. And that's a beautiful thing. We've seen how to walk. Walk worthy, chapter 4, verse 1 said. Walk like you've been invited to the party in the table of Jesus. Hold your head high. Don't let your past define you. Don't let other people let, like, remind you of your past and let that past define you. Also, don't live like you used to or conform to the world's way of doing things. Walk as children of light. Not as dark, not of darkness, and that was uh, chapter five, verse eight. Walk in wisdom, five fifteen. So there's all these things on how to walk. We've learned to be seated. We've learned now to walk. We aren't what we used to be, and we should live like we follow Jesus. That's how we should walk. Tommy Castro, the great blues artist from the Bay Area, has a song that says, "It is what it is, but it ain't what it used to be." So. So just go on and sing that song to yourself. It is what it is, but it ain't what it used to be. We're not what we used to be. We should all do what we do as to the Lord, keeping the unity through the bond of peace in all our relationships. And then the past couple of weeks, we've seen how to defend ourselves, how to dig in, how to stand against an invisible enemy, having those, those shoes, those, those cleated military sandals uh, that are in our armor, uh, the preparation of the gospel of peace. How we just can like, dig in with those and then we can move and we can travel long distances and we can dig in so we don't get knocked down with that. We've learned how to stand against an invisible enemy. So, going back to Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 in closing. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.
Hallelujah. <laughs> Lord, we thank you again uh, just for being here with us. And as we're closing up this book and tying up the loose ends, recapping a little bit, uh, Lord, we just pray that it would be written into our hearts, that you would help us, that you would remind us as we need it on how to be seated, how to, how to walk, and how to stand and how to dig in and be immovable when we need to, Lord, that we wouldn't give up ground, that we would be able to take ground, that we wouldn't be uh, knocked off our feet. And uh, Lord, just pray that you would remind us of these things, that we would walk in the spirit and not the flesh, that we would live as citizens of heaven, not citizens of earth, that we would uh, just live to that higher, that higher level of accountability, that higher code of ethics that goes with living in Jesusopolis. We've got our citizenship there. And uh, Lord, just pray that uh, as we're doing that, Lord, that uh, Lord, that you would strengthen us on our walk as we go. And uh, just pray that uh, as we go today, Lord, that, that you would just call these things, put these things into our hearts so that we would be able to recall them, Lord. Write them into our hearts. Let them be uh, something that is always right there for us when we need it. And Lord, help us to be different. Help us to, to not revert back, uh, as, as Paul wrote to the Ephesians, to the old ways, not to go back to what we used to be, but to be walking in the Spirit, Lord. And I would thank you for this opportunity, for the, the opportunity to study this book. We look forward to, uh, we look forward, Halan and I, to a little time off, and we look forward to reconvening and uh, starting a new book and uh, that new adventure. And just pray that you would be working ahead of that, uh, people would come that need to be there, that need to hear. And uh, we just thank you for your presence here, for your grace, that you have invited us to the party and uh, help us to live accordingly. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.